Good morning, everyone, and uh, happy Rosh Chodesh, and uh, happy to see all of you. Uh, today, we're actually going to look at the parts of Parashat Bereshit, which don't get much coverage because everyone's so obsessed with the six days of creation and Shabbat, and then the Garden of Eden, and Adam and Chava, then Cain and Hevel, Cain and Abel. But by the time they get here, they're like, this is a little strange, but that's about it. And they move on and they get stuck with it. it's a little strange and they don't really get into it. So I thought over the next couple of weeks, we can look at Perak and Dalad, the end of it, and then chapter, so it's chapter four, then looking at Perak Hay chapter five and a little bit of chapter six, you'll see that there's parts of it which really are striking. And if we take a, a few, sessions to have a look at them, you actually find that uh, they're a little bit uh, esoteric and require more explanation. So I want to share my screen. And we're going to take a look right after Cain leaves Hashem and goes and dwells in the land of Nod, uh, Kidmat Eden, uh, east of Eden. It says as follows. It's a bit of a, a genealogy for Cain's descendants, for Cain's descendants. Vayeda Cain et Ishto, and Cain knew his wife, he had relations with his wife, Vataha, and she conceived, Vatered et Chanoch, and she gave birth to Chanoch. Vahi Boneir, and he was a city builder, or he built a city, a builder of cities, by Krashem Ha'ir, and he called the name of the city Kashem Beno Chanoch. And he named the city after his son, uh, Enoch or Chanoch. Okay. Now, I find this interesting just in a sentence. The word Chanoch, Chinuch, is education. That perhaps. Cain himself is trying here to educate, that he's trying to create civilization, that he's trying to pass on from one generation to the next. He's generation number two. He wants to pass on to generation number three, and he wants to leave the world better than he found it. He's establishing cities. He's a city builder. That This is praiseworthy, perhaps, although... I also want to have it in the back of your minds, what happens in Parashat Noach with Migdal Bavel, with the Tower of Babel, and the, what is the, is it a good thing for us to live in cities? So I want to just put in there that there is, seems to be this situation of naming his child Chanoch, building a city called Chanoch, on the one hand, it can be seen as a good thing. On the other hand, it might lead to uh, some issues which will, which will be established uh, when we talk about uh, Tower of Babel uh, in a few months' time. Uh, Rob's put in the chat here, this is the first chronicle, chronological instance of the word ear city in Torah, for sure. I mean, again, we're only... Uh, this is the second generation building for the third generation. What does an ear mean? What does a city mean? It could even be a hamlet or a village, <laughs> maybe a town, but uh, definitely uh, there's something being formed here. There's a grouping happening here. And as I said, can be seen as positive, but we might see it turning into a negative. Vayivaleid lachanoch et irad, and chanoch, uh, Fathered Irad, the Irad Yalad at Mechuya El, and Irad fathered Mechuya El, and Mechia El gave birth to Metusha El, Mechia Yalad at Metusha El, and Metusha El Yalad at Lamech. So Mechia El gave birth to Metusha El, and Metusha El fathered Lamech or Lemech. Okay, so we're already there getting into. Chanoch is generation three, Irad is four, Mechuya El is five, and then Mutusha El is six, Lemech is generation number seven. Okay. Uh, 
we can play around with some of these words here. Irad, do you want to say that that comes from the word ear? Maybe, maybe not, probably not. Mechuyael and Mechiael, they're just interesting. Uh, I don't think there's a big different change there between Mechuyael and Mechiael, but uh, is he being, uh, is this a positive name or not? I'm not so sure. There's a lot going on there with these wordings. Uh, are they adding in here the name of Hashem into them? For sure they are, uh, Gloria. But is it... Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I like these names. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know. I just want to go quickly here and have a look. One second here. Sometimes I can see better. No, nope, don't like that one. Uh, no, okay, so. I'm not going to go too much into this, uh, but uh, perhaps for another time, we can look at some of these names. But now I want to jump into this concept here of uh, Lemech. So, so far, I've got to seven generations, and they all have, uh, and they've been hanging out in this major city called Hanoch, or major hamlet or town called Hanoch. And now something is going to change. Uh, so, Safta Susie makes a great point here. How was Cain able to establish a city if he was cursed to be a wanderer? And that's the whole thing, which is, is man following the will of God? You know, it's kind of like I was teaching to my middle school students uh, yesterday, right after God tells them they will not enter the land of Canaan because they spoke negatively about it and they have to wander for 40 years. What do they want to do? They immediately say, no, we did it wrong. We want to go and uh, inherit the land. We're going to go up there. And here they're told, don't do it. God's not with you. And they get, uh, they get bashed by the Amalekites. But it's one of those interesting things. God tells him, you're going to have to wander the world. And what does uh, Cain say? No. I'm going to build a city. I'm going to root everyone together. And perhaps that's another message there about, uh, about man, that uh, whether we like it or not, we seem to have a contrarian sense of ourselves where we wish to go against, uh, you know, Ratzon Hashem, the will of God. We know, what's, we know what's good for us, but somehow it's not as appealing as doing what's bad for us. So uh, I know that that's my on one foot, what I would say to you, Susie. Does that uh, resonate? Susie, you have to unmute. Um, yeah, no, I know. I never know where the button is to unmute it. Um, so kind of, but it would seem to me that if God wasn't happy with him establishing a city, he would explode the city or something. So it's like God said, oh, okay, fine. I mean, yes and no. I mean, it's another one of those things when we talk about, and again, we'll get more into this uh, in, in the coming stories, how soon does Hashem punish? So when we're reading Bereshit, it seems like God has a bit of a short temper, a short fuse, and he's punishing instantly. Where it seems to be that there is more and more time going along where Hashem is giving time for B'nai Yisrael or time for these characters in Bereshit to make mistakes and only punishing them after there's no sign of any change of behavior. So you're right, Hashem mm -hmm. could have blasted uh, the city of Hanoch to kingdom come like he does with uh, the cities of Sodom and Amorah, but uh, I think there's something going on that he's he has a different a different path for them. 
Uh, I'm looking at the notes here. Rav says, you could say that Cain didn't establish the city. Hanoch established it by the action of his own birth. So, yeah, could be. I mean, that's another way where you could understand the text is that Cain had a child, left the child with his mother, and that Hanoch established that city and raised it, and people stayed there, while Cain continued wandering the world. And that would make sense when it comes up to the story we're about to read about his great descendant, Lamech and how Cain eventually uh, dies. That if Cain was always around, then I don't think we would have had this issue of people uh, mixing him up and uh, making a mistake of uh, who he is. So let me jump to that, okay? So I'm using my source sheet called Lemech and Shet. It says as follows, Vaykach lo Lemech Shete Nashim. And this is the first instance of this, that, yet, that uh, Lemech, instead of having one wife, he took two wives. Shem ha'achat Ada, v'shem ha'shenit Tzila. One was called Ada, and the second one was called Tzila. Vatelet Ada et Yaval, and Ada gave birth to Yaval. Hu haya avi yoshev ohel umikneh. And uh, Yaval was the father of, or the founder of uh, the dwellers of tents and uh, shepherding, okay? Or uh, herds, whatever you want to say. Like he, he is the, uh, he, he's into animal husbandry. Could be that this is the formation here of uh, going from uh, and hunter-gatherers to being city dwellers. There's something going on here where they're dwelling permanently. They've got their, uh, they're establishing a civilization there, so to speak. V'shem uh, Achiv Yuval, and his brother's name was Yuval. Hu haya avi kol tofes kinor v'ugav. And he was the father of what? All the musical instruments those who play the lyre and the pipe. Okay, so very nice. He's got a, one's a musician and one's a shepherd and a, a tent builder. Okay, so one builds homes, one's a musician. That's, that, that's his kids. Then it says, Kavet, but Tzila Gamhi Yaleda, Tzila also, she gave birth to Tuval Kain. Lotesh kol choresh nechoshe Tuval Zel, and what was Tuval Kayin? He forged all implements of copper and iron, and the sister of Tuval Kayin was Naama. And immediately, we have so many questions about this portion of the text. We have, wait a minute, a girl is being mentioned here, other than Eve. This is the first, this is the second woman to be mentioned. Sorry, not the second one. We got the names of the wives. So that's big information. And then we have a, a daughter being born. What's going on here? Other than uh, Chava, who was create, who we have the two descriptions of her creation. This is the first time that is recorded of a girl being born. And her name is Naama. And why is she mentioned here? And then understanding that Tuval Kayan, he works with metals. And is that a positive or a negative thing we're going to see? Again, I could imagine it for positive. I could imagine it for negative. Uh, and then also, what is this notion of him having two wives? And what does it mean she also gave birth? It's a bit of a strange language uh, in there. So before reading more of the uh, sukim there, I want to go down to the commentaries. Uh, you know what? Sometimes I make sheets and then I don't put the right, I don't put all the commentaries that I expect on them. So I'm going to open to you another sheet. Hold on. Always happens like this. Feel like I'm prepared and then not always. Okay. Give me one second. All right.
Okay, and Lemech took for himself uh, these two wives. What does it mean, two wives? This was the custom of the generation that lived before the time of the flood. They had two wives, said Rashi, one for childbearing and the other for frivolous companionship and charm. The latter was given a cup of some drug to drink in order that she might become barren and was dressed up like a bride and fed with the best food, whilst her fellow wife was left without her husband's companionship and even mourned like a widow. Okay, so Rashi presents this as a judgment on that generation that they had a terrible society, that they had a trophy bride, and they had a wife, and, and they had a, a wife for raising children, basically. And never should the two be mixed. The trophy bride should not have children. The trophy bride is there for her beauty and she is to be praised. And the one who is for motherhood, and that's all she is, she's just for just for procreation, nothing else. Uh, so what happens in the story? The story here is that Ada was the one who was for propagation and she was named because she was repulsive to him and she was kept aloof from other uh, from him so because ada is uh from the aramaic word for surah which is kept aloof kept away but sila means she was the one for companionship alone and she was so named because she always abided in his cell in his shadow Okay, so one was the companion wife, uh, wife and one was for procreation. Okay, but here it said that Sila Gamhi, that Sila was meant to be the trophy bride, she also had uh, children. What does that mean? But before we get there, that uh, his name here is Tuval Cain, which connects him to Cain, to Cain. So what does it mean? He refined, it says Rashi, he refined Cain's handicraft. The word Tuval is connected in meaning with Tavlin, such as spices which give a refined and improved taste of food. He refined and improved the work of Cain, how? By providing weapons for murderers. So here, what's it saying? That the goal of, why is he called Tuval Cain? This child should never have come into being in Lemech's mind. And instead of using metals for good, he takes metals and uses them for weapons. And he gives these weapons to murderers. He gives these weapons to people who are going to do harm, cause harm, to others. Uh, and then continuing there, Rashi says, he sharpened tools used in brass and iron work. He sharpened it. Uh, so this is not a good thing about Tuvarkain. It sounds like he's not a great young man. And Naama, uh, Rashi quotes the Midrash that that was Noah's wife. And that's why she gets mentioned here. Now, so far, if I'm just reading Rashi, I'm getting the position here that this is not altogether a positive situation happening. The woman, A, he should never have married two wives, although everyone was doing it back then. That's not really an excuse, but it is explaining the uh, behavior of the time. So he wasn't doing anything uh, unique, but certainly their morality was questionable. And then that the one who was not meant to have children gave birth to a child and that, that one of those children at least seems to be uh, making his parnasa, making his livelihood from ill-gotten gains by making weapons for people 
and the people who want weapons are going to not necessarily do good things. There are other commentaries that I will say that can read this on a more chat level that Tuvar Kain did not make weapons. He made things out of metals and there's nothing overly terrible about it. Rob, yes. There's there's one other positive thing which you didn't mention. I, I think I, and I think this is a this is a comment from Rashi also that when when um, when the first son was born, you know, there's so there's there's four kids here, right? So the first son, um, Yaval, uh, you mentioned that he was an expert in animal husbandry. That this was a, a, he was a this was an art that was that was lost in the murder of 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 uh, Abel. 100% so. that you exactly right, Rob, that you could say that through Cain's descendants, they were trying to do a tikkun for what they'd lost through Hevel, but then through Tuval Cain, it's all going to go very badly. But there's something here that trying to fix what went wrong with Cain and how he killed Hevel, but it's not working out exactly. It's a good. Uh, and tell me more about that. Do you think they lost it again, or do you think it was uh, kept? It's something that I really like. It's, it's, it seems to say that that even though there was this, you know, the most horrible thing, you know, the the, the murder of and, uh, of your own brother, that still, you know, after after some time, uh, we can still repair ourselves, and uh, and we still have a chance for redemption, and, and and we still have a chance to restore what was lost. Love it. I think it's a very, very good thing. I appreciate you uh, adding that in. So now we're going to get into this Pasuk, Kaf Gimel. Okay, now you have all that background story. It says here, Vayome lemech lenashav adav etzila shma'an koli neshe lemech hazena imrati ki ish haragti Lefitzi Vayelech Lechaburati. It's a very difficult person to translate. Lemech said to his wives, Ada and Tzila, listen to my voice, wives of Lemech. Give ear to my speech, or more, just listen to me. I have slain a man for wounding me and a lad for bruising me. The English doesn't really help us that much more. For I have killed a man, Lefitzi, I've killed a man for wounding me, for doing a petza, and a child for bruising me. What exactly is happening here? And then Kafdalad, ki shivatayim yukam kain, belemech shivim veshiva. For if Kain could live for seven generations, should Lemech live for 77? Or if Kain, there's a translation there, a little different. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lemech 77-fold. Now, here is a classic example of two psukim that if you do not have commentaries, if you do not have a Torah Shabbat pair, an oral tradition, then it's very difficult to make sense of those two psukim. What on earth is Lemech trying to do? Who? Why is he trying to appease his wives? Clearly his wives are upset with him. Please listen to me, wives of Lemech. What I did, I had to do, or I have justification for. And if Cain deserves punishment, then I deserve less punishment than he does. So uh, Susie's put here, Art Scroll translates this statement as a question. Have I slain a man by my wound? and a child by my bruise. And so therefore he's trying to almost, uh, if you want to read the art scroll there based on Rashi, he's trying to get into it more that I am, am I responsible for my actions? 
If I create, if I did manslaughter, again, going back to last week, did Cain kill deliberately? Open to interpretation. Here, and again, it's not explaining who he's killed or what he's done, but he's saying, whatever I did, I did through misadventure, through uh, without intent. And so therefore, if Cain desires sevenfold punishment or a seven generation delay in punishment, then I should be punished much later. I should have an even slower time to be punished. So let's have a look at the commentaries and see how they explain what's happening here. Uh, so let's start with Rashi. Shema'an koli, listen to my voice. Shehayu porshot mimenu mitashmish. The women had stopped sleeping with him. Lefi sheharagat kain betuva kain bena. Why? Because somehow Lemech had killed his ancestor Cain and his son Tuvakain. How did this come about? Rashi created quoting Midrash. Shaya Lemech Suma. Lemech was blind. The Tuvakain Moshcha. And Tuvakain would lead him along. The Ra'a et Kain. The Nidmalo Kechaya. And so what happened? Tuval Kain sees Kain from a distance, and he thinks that Kain is a wild animal. Aviv, and he says to his father, Limshoch Bakeshet, draw your bow, the Harago, and he kills his ancestor Kain. Says Rashi continuing. The Kevan she yada shehu kain zekeno, he ka kaf el kaf. And when Kain realized that he had killed his ancestor Kain, so when sorry Lemech realized he'd killed his ancestor Kain, he smacked his hands together. The safaket beno benehem beharago. And because he was blind, he didn't realize that as he was clapping his hands, his son's head was between his hands, and the clap that he did killed his son. And so his wife said, you know what, we want nothing to do with this man, and he was trying to appease them. The next Rashi, Shema'an Bekoli, listen to me, what's he saying here? Listen to me and come back to me. Why? For the man that I killed, was he killed by my wounding? I Did I do it with premeditation? That my wound should be called by my name? And the child that I killed, was it killed by my blow? Did I do these intentionally? Did I not act inadvertently and not with premeditation? This was not my wound, nor was this my blow. Okay, so this is again understanding, uh, Susie, why does Art Scroll translate it as a question mark? Because they're reading the, inter the translation is based on Rashi's interpretation, which is he's saying it facetiously, questioningly. What are you doing? How can I be punished? I didn't mean to kill. I was blind. I pulled a, I was told to shoot at the deer. I went to the deer and it wasn't my deer. It was my deer. Sorry, I need to play that one for you. It was my dear great grandfather. And so I clapped my hands and bang, who's there? It's my son. I killed two people, but I didn't mean to. That's the way Rashi understands the text. Uh, and then, so why does he say, Ki shivatayin yukam kain? Kain sharag mezid nitbalo ad shashivadorot. So remember, it was Rashi last week who said that 
Cain did this deliberately, if he killed intentionally and he wasn't punished for seven generations, Anisha Rakti Shogeg, I who killed inadvertently by mistake, should not be many sevens, many, many generations until I should be punished. Okay, if, if he had his uh, death sentence commuted to, uh, to being punished much later, then how much more so should my sentence be commuted many, many generations? And then one more Rashi, uh, he says here, 70 and seven, he used a term that denotes many periods of seven generations. Thus did Rabbi Tanchuma explain this passage, but the Midrash, Rabbah, does not mention that Lemech slew anyone at all, and only states that his wives had lived apart from him after they had born children, because God's decree had been issued that Cain's descendants should be exterminated after seven generations. They said, why should we bear children only to be destroyed? Soon the flood will come and will sweep away everyone. Lemech said to them, did I slay a man, Lepetza, for my wounding, i.e., that I should be wounded, punished? Did I slay Hevel, who was a man in height, but a child in years, that my descendants should be exterminated on account of the sin, the sin of Cain who killed Hevel? If Cain who did kill had his punishment suspended until the seventh generation, I, who have not killed, does it not necessarily follow that my punishment should be suspended for many seven generations? This, however, is an absurd argument of a Kalva Homer, for if so, God, he could never exact his debt nor fulfill his word. Uh, so trying to understand, and I'll get to Gloria's question in a second, trying to understand what exactly is Lemech saying here. So here's one stream. One stream is Lemech is saying, I don't deserve to be punished like Cain because I did it unintentionally, Bishogeg, whereas my ancestor Cain, he killed deliberately. That's one school, okay? And so therefore, if Lemech is punished, if Cain was punished seven generations later, I should wait even more for my punishment. The next argument he's saying is, if I am being punished because I'm the seventh generation from Cain and that all of Cain's descendants will be killed after seven generations, that's not fair because I haven't done anything. It should be Cain who's punished, not me. And that's, we're saying that's a silly argument and it doesn't make sense. And we all know that we are not punished for our ancestors. We are punished for our own sins. I'm just looking here at uh, the questions here. Gloria writes, do the numbers of the generations somehow relate to the time of Noah and the floods and the Mabul? Uh, so we're going to get here, which is uh, there's 10 generations between Adam and Noah. So it's it could well be that these people who we're mentioning are going to be killed in the flood. That's how they're going to meet their end. Uh, Esther writes, if it is as if we've come full circle and then some. Cain killed his brother, Lemech killed his ancestor and his son with no admission of guilt or atonement. And so, yes, Esther, this is exactly the point, which is, why does Lemech deserve to die straight away and not later? Why should his wives never go back to him? Because he hasn't internalized the lesson. He's still repeating the same trope, which is, I am not taking responsibility for my actions. Bereshit, especially the parasha, but also the sefer, especially the book, is people not taking on responsibility. So yes, Esther, we've come full circle, and that's why all of these people deserve to, uh, to be wiped out by the flood, because they're just not getting it. There seems to be a total misunderstanding here of life, which is 
No, you can't make mistakes. We all make mistakes, but we have to own our mistakes. And this seems to be something which is way beyond Cain or even his descendants. They're still playing this game of not taking responsibility. I'll make a weapon, but I'm not going to say it was my fault that somebody got killed. I'm going to kill someone and then say, well, I didn't really mean it, so can I take it back? I mean, there's something very disappointing here. Sharona. And the symbolism is so outright of the not taking responsibility of like, well, I couldn't see what was right in front of me. Oh, well, my hands did it, but I didn't know they were doing it, right? Like the Midrash that Rashi brings could be more cryptic, but it's really bizarre in how blatant it is of this, of the actions that take place. I mean, clapping doesn't really kill by any logical, you never read a newspaper article about somebody who died by being clapped to death. Um, but that's still the story being told because it, it needs to be so blatant of the, how our actions that are right in front of us that we can't take credit for. Absolutely, and again, I'm going to do two very physical acts. I'm gonna draw my bow and I'm gonna say I'm blind. So I, I'm not taking a responsibility. I'm gonna clap my hands. Oh, those were my hands. My feet were doing something else. My eyes and my nose and my ears and my brain, they were elsewhere. The, the, yeah, absolutely. There, there, there's a real, real issue here. Uh, and Esther adds here, except Hanoch, Cain may have begun a tikkun with him in chapter five. Uh, Esther, you're talking about the same, the, this, the, the Hanoch in chapter five is not the Hanoch in chapter four. And we're going to get into that one as well, which is uh, Shet in next week. Shet has a child who called, uh, or a descendant called Hanoch as well, but it's a different one. Uh, Rob? So Lamech has two sons by one wife. Okay, so the, there's a set of brothers there, and uh, they don't kill each other. Okay, uh, and then there's, there's a third son that he has by, by a second wife. And even though they have brothers, they... They don't kill each other either. Okay, there's there's a finally you know some generation of, of, of brothers that come and go w without them killing each other, and 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 this shows you know I, let's assume Cain is still alive even this this shows to Cain you know you know hey it's 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 possible for brothers to not kill each other, and which makes makes Cain look look really bad now. You know if it, it's he, he says you know that you. You set a bad standard of behavior. I'm setting the good standard of behavior, and in a way, he's um, Lamech is is killing Cain all over again. <laughs> you know, he's you know, he's he's a uh, he's by by example so much better than 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 what Cain did. He's showing him the proper way to live, and and is shaming Cain so much here. Absolutely, but again, somehow it all unravels. And basically, this whole line we're going to see. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. I, I, there's, there's a piece which I want to share with you in a couple of weeks about uh, the daughters of man and the sons of God, as it were, and who those sons of God are. Uh, but one interpretation is that there's a mixing of the lines, that the generations of, uh, of Cain and the descendants of Cain are marrying the uh, the daughters from another line, and it's all mixing up here, that there's an issue going on that, uh, on the one hand, Rob, I, I, I love your uh, ability to see the positive that, that is positive in Cain's line, that they are bringing back animal husbandry, that they can be musicians, but they can also be weapon they can also make weapons and be murderers so i think there's something going in there that there's some there there's potential for good but there's also right at the door there's also this uh, notion of uh, of evil as well within them but again maybe that's the nature of man also that we have good in us but there's also a lot of uh, negativity not necessarily 
just uh, a limitation on uh, on Cain and his descendants. Now, let's have a look here, going back up, just two psukim about uh, Adam and Chava have another child after Cain and Hevel. Vayeda Adam od et ishto. Adam uh, knew his wife again, had relations with her again, Vatelet ben, and she gave birth to a son, Vatikrat Shemo Shet, and she called him Shet. Kishatli Elohim Zera Acher Tachat Hevel Kiharago Kain. How would she call him? She says, Why'd she call him Shet? God has provided me with another offspring in place of Hevel, for Kain had killed him. Okay. Ul Shet Gamhu Yulad Ben, and Shet also had a son. By Kriat Shemo Enosh, and his name was called Enosh, as Huchal Likro Beshem Hashem. And he, this word Huchal, I will not translate, to call in the name of Hashem. Now, and this is something which I want to work with you again. We could look at all our translations as we want, but what is my fundamental teaching over the eight, ten years that we've all been learning together, a translation is always a commentary. So we're going to try and break down the word, hey, vav, chet, lamed, what are the possibilities? And the possibilities are chol, meaning profane, non-holy, or, or non-sacred, or techila, beginning. Therefore, depending how I understand this verse, it means he was the first to call in the name of Hashem. Could be very, very positive. Or it could be Hashem, meaning he was the first to profane the name of Hashem. He or a combination, he began to profane the name of Hashem, I want to add them both together. This, my friends, is classic understanding text and understanding commentary. We skip down all the way to Rashi. Rashi says, as huchal, lashon chulin. This is the language of making something profane. He called the names of men and the names of idols after the name of the Holy One, blessed be He, making them objects of idolatrous worship and calling them deities. What's Rashi saying he was the first person to become an idolater. How long did it take? Three generations. Adam knew God, spoke to God. Shet didn't know God, but had firsthand knowledge or secondhand knowledge from his father. And then we have Enosh. So he's the grandson of Adam. Adam and Chava are still alive, and he's already creating idolatry. Ibn Ezra, very different. The dikduk huchal mefaleha kefer v'luleha yot hachet megron haya nidgash v'migzerat techila v'tam shehechilu lehit palel. Ibn Ezra here wants to say two things. Number one, it's coming from he began, from the word techila, to pray. And also he explains why it can't be a chilul Hashem. I'm going to explain it here as well. See in the English. Huchal, began, belongs to those verbs whose second and third root letters are identical. If the chet were not a guttural, it would have received a dagesh. So that's all very grammatical. What does that mean? Huchal comes from the same root as techila, first. 
Therefore, the meaning of the clause is, then began men to call upon the name of Hashem is, then men first started to do tefillah. If Hucha were derived from Chilul, meaning profane, then the name of the Lord would follow profane. So he wants to tell us it's not possible in a grammatical way for it to be the way that Rashi quotes the Midrash. And he wants a much more positive thing, which is he's the first person to establish tefillah. It's very, very positive. It's very nice. Okay, that's the Ibn Ezra. Sephorno, a, a, a super commentary on Rashi says, at that time, the righteous people of the earth began to preach monotheism to the public. The meaning is similar to Bereshit. Avraham proclaimed there the name of Hashem, the Lord of the universe. The time had come to publicly confront and refute the arguments of the idolaters in that period. So here, it's not that Enosh is doing something bad. He's actually defending Hashem. So it's interesting that the Sforno, who is a super commentary on Rashi, actually likes the Ibn Ezra's approach more than is more than looking at Rashi. And Glory adds here, real Sephardi Ibn Ezra, positive understanding. <laughs> there you go. I, will, I won't say no. And then the Gur Arya, another super commentary on, on Rashi says, then man began to call upon the name. This cannot mean that at that time they began calling upon Hashem, because earlier generations had done so as well. For this reason, the sages interpret the statement negatively. He says, it can't be that he is the first. It can't be that he's the first to call up in the name of Hashem, because you've got Adam and Hevel. They brought Korbanot. And so therefore, who is it? It must be he's beginning to profane the name of Hashem. So Gor Arye is supporting his team. He's supporting the Rashi and Midrashic school. Uh, and finally, we'll have a look at the Radak, a little longer commentary. And he says, As Hashem, then some commentary commentators understand the word Huchal in the sense of chilul, desecrating, profaning. Others, including Rashi, understand it in the sense of Hatchala, beginning. Interesting there, because I thought that Rashi was on the school of chilul, but. Uh, I'm not going to debate the Radak. In Onkelos, we find two versions. According to one version, people became lax in worshipping God in the days of Hanoch. According to the other version of Onkelos, in Hanoch's day, people began to proclaim the name of Hashem, i.e. what had been something natural up until then had been reintroduced and had become practically extinct. If the second interpretation is correct, the decline of religious observance was arrested for the first time in the days of Hanoch, when people found it necessary to pray to Hashem, uh, sorry, not Hanoch, Enosh, when people found it necessary to pray to God when they found themselves in trouble. Up until that time, they had not even thought that tefillah could be helpful in affecting their fate on earth. They considered God's decree as irreversible and under any circumstances, according to what we have seen in the writings of our sages, and according to the understanding of most people, that idolatry was widespread in the days of Enosh, the meaning of the verse before must be that in Enosh's time, many people began to look upon the celestial phenomena as deities and address them and worship them as gods. They did so because they considered these phenomena as intermediaries, because between them and the invisible God, seeing that these phenomena had been appointed by God to run the terrest ter terrestrial part of the universe on his behalf, they considered these forces as capable of bestowing favors on those worshiping them. Gradually, such initial errors spread until most forms of idolatry nowadays are totally devoid of any rationale. In people's minds, natural forces are perceived as competing with each other and, pro and possessing overlapping domains. So unless one worships at least several of them, 
one would arouse the jealousy of the one ignored. The matter has become so grotesque that man made statues that neither see or hear and are credited with being able to influence the lives of intelligent human beings. So the reason why I brought to you that commentary of the Radak is because it's synthesis. He, pre he, pre he presents the possibility of both and explains how it could be Enosh who is establishing don't worship idols, worship Hashem and Tefillah, but also explain that it's in the time of Enosh where idolatry was widespread. And so therefore, or began widespread and how idolatry became established in the world and how it's become, uh, became rooted for thousands of years. So I think I like the Radak because he is taking both and saying, there's individuals who are praying to Hashem, but sadly the world was falling for the world of idolatry. Uh, okay, so any comments on that, what we've seen from the Ibn Ezra, from the Radak, from Rashi, from comments about Tuval Kayin, th there we notice that that is our chapter. And again, these are four or five sukim, which are often just rushed through, but we can see there's so much to glean from of our understanding and our relationship to Hashem. Are we praising Hashem? Are we cursed, or, or is this the beginning of idolatry, or is it a synthesis of both? Sharona. I just think it's interesting if you look um, at Genesis from Christian lenses, it's all about the Garden of Eden and original sin and, and all of that. And that's sort of the end, and then how life is about repairing that original sin that we can't get around. But, but our Torah understanding is actually the levels of sin and where we went off track are so many and require so many different directions of repair of our relationship with our creator, our interpersonal relationships, um, and all the different areas where that's made very clear from the beginning over and over again so that we can really be analytical from the beginning of all the places that require self-improvement. And I just, I love all the layers. Love it too. Again, I, I think I could relearn very sheet every. It's such, it's such a wonderful uh, thing for uh, relationships, for a relationship with Hashem, as you said, and relation an interpersonal relationship. There's so much going on here, and uh, yeah, I think that's about all that I have time for today. Uh, next week we are going to have a look at another person called Chanoch, which Esther briefly touched upon, which was. At the age of 365, he was no longer. We've got to find out what happened there. So please tune in and uh, I'll see you all next week. Have a wonderful week and Chodesh Tov.